All right. So on this on this blended layer, that's when I have to actually scrutinize the proportions a little bit. And this is where I can kind of fix little errors in my base painting layer of the angles of things like her nose. I can uh, build in the the shape of the eyelids. And I'm looking at my primary reference, but I might also really refer to some of the other references. For instance, uh, in the primary reference, her teeth are showing and her mouth is open. But I kind of like this more steely, you know, lips closed look. But that means I need to frame her lips a little differently. And again, I'm not trying to just make it look exactly like her. I'm trying to get the, the essence of it. Portraiture is it's an interesting art form because you're trying to do more than what a photograph can do, I think. We're not trying to compete with photography. <laughs> and there is a little like glint in the eye and you can put that in, but make sure you have the eyes kind of looking believably at the same place. And don't get too caught up in those details. I think we do get caught up in details because we, we don't really believe we can do it ourselves. So we have to kind of show us show ourselves that we can make something look like it's supposed to look. But trust me, you guys can. Just trust yourselves. Have fun with it. And you get better as you do it. Now, one thing that can happen, especially when you're doing the blended color, like I'm doing her lips right now, is you can start to think of what's called symbolic color. So if I'm doing her lips and I'm thinking, oh, lipstick, and I'm thinking red, that has no basis on the lighting of the rest of this, right? So don't trick yourself into thinking you know what the color is. Just try different things out and try to be objective about it. It helps to see it from a distance too. Especially when you're using really bold colors like I am, the value can really get away from you. And sometimes you just need to knock a lot of those back. And that's safer in the blended layer because then you have little hints of those colors still coming through. And then as you want to get more and more blended, you just take your opacity down lower and lower. So basically on this blended color layer, I'm working on highlights and shadows, but I'm really working between about 50% and 70% opacity. And you can see how it really starts to work between those chunkier shapes you have on your base color layer. And I'm still trying to force myself not to zoom in, right? So I am going a little bit slower as I'm defining these shapes with my brush. But zooming in is only going to demoralize you at this point. <laughs> Let's show you how much you still have to do. And you can throw in kind of uh, random colors every once in a while into the blend. So you have to adapt to them. It's kind of what I see as my um, early 20th century kind of modernist color experiments. They're based somewhat on reality, but they're on kind of extremes of reality. So they're more impressionistic. And we can just force those colors in if we want them. So if I want a bright red in her eyebrow, I can just do that. I mean, these dudes also do. Yeah. I mean, like, it's still, like, it's just, like, it's fine. I mean, yeah, anything. Actually, I'm probably thinking, I mean, I would do that here. But, like, what? Like, what? Like, what? Last time, the last time I did a project, I said you had to do it. It's not hard, but it's a 
Yeah, I was really good. I was, she was only going to do her too, but uh, Camila, yeah. I was just, you know, I had to pick like three to me. I was just going to do her. Oh, oh. So as you get more and more into your blending, you'll realize you're not stealing colors from reference so much anymore. You're mostly just stealing them from yourself and the palette that you've set up. And there's nothing wrong with that. All right. So that's the natural progression of it. And the reason the tablet is so important to this is because the direction of your stroke matters a whole lot. So I try to think of it like I'm actually using paint from a tube, kind of thick oil paint from a tube, and I want each stroke to actually have like a weight to it that defines sculpturally the thing I'm painting. So when you're doing a face, you can think of it like a makeup brush that you're painting along that, that face. And so you follow the curves of the face with each stroke, because to go against them just kind of hurts the overall communication. Now you can play with things like uh, cool colors, like these purples and these uh, deep magentas and things I'm using. Those can be in your shadows, and then you keep your warm colors, your yellows, your oranges, your bright reds on the highlight side. But they're not going to seem as warm or as cool unless you contrast them with, with their partner. Right? So if I throw some oranges over here, it's going to make those cools seem a lot cooler. And squinting is always helpful. Seeing it from a distance is always helpful. Because at the end of the day, it's just about where the shadows are and where the highlights are. And the place where you need the most paint is where they transition into each other. What are called the midtones. Now, just like I think it's better to use hard edges than soft edges, because you can always soften a hard edge, but it's very hard to sharpen a soft edge. When I'm doing this kind of painting, I think it's better to use really bold, saturated color, because it's easy to take saturation away in Photoshop, but it's very hard to put it back in. So, just for instance, if I take my... Um, my whole painting and I just hold down option and then go to layer flatten image or merge visible but holding down option it puts it all onto one layer for me then I can do something like play with its saturation and take it way down no matter how bright your colors are you want them to work in grayscale you want them to still have the value range and so I like the colors I have going on in the hair I need to allow myself to go a little bit darker still on the colors in the forehead, even though that feels uncomfortable. And all of that's starting to work because it's easy to take color away. You can add saturation, but that, that looks a little crazy. <laughs> so in my opinion, better just to use pretty bold color and then just tone it down, even if you're going for realism. It's always nice to have color there. That's something photography can't do as easily. And if you've built a nice little value range for yourself, then you have a cheat sheet for where you do need to make things darker. You know what colors to blend with. So as I'm going over my blended colors in the same area the third or fourth time, I'm doing it at a lower opacity. But I, don't, I try not to go um, below 50%. That's more for kind of finishing things off. 
And as I start to worry about little details, then I might zoom in a little bit more and use the navigator. Now to do a full painting that I'm really happy with, you know, something for a client, it takes several stages of this. So it's a little bit longer than we have time for in this one assignment. But if you just fall in love with digital painting, then all it takes is the commitment of time to keep building it up. So I need a little bit more shadow on her upper lip. And just because this is digital painting, not digital coloring, it doesn't mean that you might not benefit from outlining something a little bit. So performers like Nina Simone often wear eyeliner to kind of outline their eyes so they're seen better from, from the stage. So you as a painter can definitely kind of outline features. But the difference between a painted line and a drawn line is the painted line is like a fill in Illustrator. It has two sides to it. And the difference is one side of it can be um, softened. Right. And here I am painting on a layer that I combined just to show you something. That was a mistake. <laughs> so what happens if you do? You paint on a layer, you make a lot of mistakes. Well, what you can do, it is just compositing, right? You just take the stuff you like from that layer, you duplicate it, you get rid of it on another layer, and you might even play with compositing it a little bit. I have her eyes a little bit wide apart, so I'm going to just warp, warp them a little bit, bring them in. And I need to get the, the underside of her nose a little bit better. And it's good to look at it from a distance as well. Let's see if warping can solve this for me. Yeah, I don't think I'm doing it much favors, but what I can do is take it down. That softens everything a little bit. Kind of push it back into place. There's lots of ways to soften hard edges. And then you can always merge layers back together. So it's kind of a Rembrandt painting trick, especially in portraiture, just to soften things. Our eye is more forgiving of soft focus, right? The Vaseline on the camera lens for soap operas, especially if you're trying to make something that's, that's more flattering. So here I'm going to use the eraser for the first time just to soften that, that um, lassoed edge. But mostly I'm just going to keep using the same tools. And now I'll do some more detailed work. I'm going to merge these together. My blended paint layer. Okay, now here's the trick with reference. I have all my references here. This is where this kind of shortcut of bringing them into the file itself breaks down a little bit. Is that if I want to make the eye, I also want to be able to zoom in on these features but see the reference clearly. So the way to do that a little bit more easily, I could of course unlock my reference, bring this one down. Which one is it? This one. Bring this one down so I can see it, you know, closely while I...